Hello and welcome to Digital Marketing Masterclass. We have a very, very special show today. Today we have Will Wang with Growth Labs. Will, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Excited to be here, man. Awesome, awesome. So we were uh, connected. I think that I was on your show first and now we're kind of returning the favor. And I remember leaving the show thinking, man, this guy is really, really smart. And so I'm really excited to have you on. Thanks, dude. Kind of have you drop some knowledge here. Uh, we're going to be talking today about how to make data-driven decisions. We're going to talk about analytics. We're going to talk about the secret sauce that Will does with for his company and for his clients. And so before I do that, tell me a little bit about yourself and then tell me a little bit about Growth Labs. Yeah, sure. So um, I come from uh, a, a background in data. So I used to run um, business intelligence I. IT teams back in my previous life, back in corporate, um, really didn't like that, really didn't like all the stuff that goes on in corporate and the politics. Uh, so decided, hey, here's a smart decision. Why don't I give up a six-figure salary and go try to do this thing for myself, uh, which was probably the best and worst decision I've ever made. Um, it was a massive struggle. And I built up a company based around, or you know, I started as a freelancer actually, mm. uh, doing copywriting for clients, but also overlaying a, a, a data mindset on top of the copy. Um, and so, you know, the company's evolved. We started doing everything under the sun when it comes to marketing. And now we've kind of found our sweet spot in terms of working with B2B businesses, um, doing cold email outreach for them, and also building funnels and running traffic for them as well. So those are kind of our, our, our two main uh, splits in terms of what we actually provide as a service. And then what was sort of your superpower before you kind of, you know, moved up to the level you're at right now? Uh, I think my superpower was, well, the way I look at it, there was kind of two. One was um, the, the ability to be comfortable being the dumbest guy in the room and just having you know, <laughs> the, the mindset of just trying to learn. Um, I, I struggled a lot in terms of, uh, you know, I was massively introverted, couldn't talk on the phone, had phone phobia. So the thing that they gave me though was, was the ability to, to be empathetic and just to shut up and listen. Mm. So I think that was one of the you know, superpowers I had. Uh, that was a mindset thing. The second one was um, I grew up in a pretty rough neighborhood. So I used to run to the library after school and, you know, devour books and things like that. So the second wow. thing was I love words. Um, the ability to think about words and copy and how to make, you know, people actually interested in reading what, what I had to write. Uh, I think that was probably my second superpower. So um, being able to listen and learn and then being able to write copy. Wow, that's great. So you have a very data heavy company. And so a lot of people, when they're data heavy, they usually don't like words. You know, they're kind of data nerds. Mm. And so it's actually kind of rare that you have both of these skill sets at the same time. How do you think you, you think you got lucky or what do you, is, did you work on one over the other? Or how did, how did all that work out? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think my natively as, as a, person, I, I love words. I love copy. I love how things read, how to engage people. It's this magical thing, right? Where humans look at these scribbles on a page and they, in their own minds, form a picture. So I've always been mesmerized by that kind of stuff. And I've absolutely geeked out in copy. Uh, the data thing was more of a learned kind of skill set. Yeah. So as I was going through university and trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I jumped between about six degrees and I finally settled on IT because that was pretty simple and uh, well, simple, but you know, not necessarily easy. Mm -hmm. But my, my dad was, had always been in IT. So he helped me move into the IT degree, helped me to pretty much pass the degree. Um, but then a couple of jobs kind of fell into my lap or, you know, I went for jobs that I probably shouldn't have <laughs> and the jobs were all in data. So I had to really quickly learn the data stuff. It didn't come, um, my, my personality, I'm more of a, of a creative in terms of writing, but I was forced to learn how to use data effectively to, to kind of pay, you know, to actually get paid. Um, yeah. So those two kind of mixed pretty well. That's great. And did you go to school in New Zealand or did you go to school in the United States? Where did you go to school? Uh, so I'm actually based in Australia, uh, but oh, I used to spend a lot of time in New Zealand. So yeah. No, you, it, uh, it's so good. I, I, I've been to New Zealand about 15 times. I absolutely love it. Okay. One point considered moving. So cl close enough, close <laughs> enough. We're pretty much neighbors anyway. Yep. Um, yeah, so grew up in, in Sydney, um, went to school in Sydney here as well. Okay. And yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where the background. So we're a little bit behind in terms of data actually compared to, compared to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I mean, yep. that, that's kind of the background. And then, and then when did you uh, start Growth Labs? What year? We've been in business for about 
coming up to seven years now. So I think would have been, yeah, so it would have been 2018. My, my math is horrible. So oh, probably 2018, <laughs> 2019, <Wow. laughs> about, about there. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And then how big is your team? So at the moment, we're about 20 people strong. Nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. We have a, we have a very similar size team. I have just north of 25 full time. And then nice. uh, we have a ton of subcontractors because all of our writing team are subcontractors and uh, and some nice. of our offshore talent as well. Um, so, you know, it puts us a little bit north of 50, which is uncomfortable for me That's in the awesome. aspect of I remember <laughs> the days of knowing everybody's name, the names of their kids and every detail. And now it's starting to get one of those mm. things where, you know, just sh- 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 you know, it's very intimidating, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think the other side of it too is I was actually saying, saying this to my wife yesterday, like the amount that we're spending on salaries and expenses every month, it, it yeah. far exceeded what it used to make in a single year at corporate. Uh, yeah. So it's like a massive mindset oh, shift. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're well over a million a year um, in salaries on my side. So it sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when we made a million in revenue and thought I was like the coolest kid in town. And then now that's what we spend in <laughs> salaries, you know, it's like goodness. Yeah. 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 So, um, let's talk about data driven decisions. Um, you know, mm. when you, let's start out, what tools do you, do you prefer? You know, um, do you use certain ones regularly? Does it, does it vary from client to client? What tools do you really like and, and why do you, why do you choose those over others? Yeah, so the majority of the work that we do is actually based around around cold emails for our clients. So the main tool that we use, uh, there's two sides of it, right? One is us where we go and build a list for our clients. Mm-hmm. We actually don't buy a list and we build a list from scratch. So there's about five mm-hmm. or six different tools that we use. We built an API for ourselves. Uh, for that, for those tools, it's things like Clearbit, it's things like um, mm-hmm. Hunter, for example. Yep. Uh, it's all these different platforms that we use to clean emails. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the analytics on that is the, the verified email find rate, we, so we call it. Yep. You know, of a thousand people that we think we have, who, you know, how many people do we actually get contact with? Mm-hmm. Uh, the other side of it is sending emails, how many, you know, and tracking what gets into inboxes, what gets open, what gets replied to. We use a really great tool called QuickMail. So I believe the uh, website's quickmail.io. What's it called? Uh, QuickMail. QuickMail? So quick as in fast and the mail as in you know, yeah. M-A-I-L. <laughs> it's funny, your accent. <laughs> I have to hear yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yep. That's not nice. good. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so um, what, Quick Mail is this what, really what great quick, tool. That, what, what makes Quick Mail unique? Uh, so a bit of background on, on Quick Mail. It's a tool designed specifically for cold emailing, designed by an engineer. So all the functionality behind the scenes is actually pretty amazing. Mm. Um, they keep the servers really... We run our own email servers, but the way that... Um, quick mail integrates into email servers we've built and the way it tracks the data, the way it sends the emails, like there's nothing like it. Wow. Um, so we, you know, yeah, we, we have hundreds of accounts on there for our clients and ourselves and it just works really, really well. Um, and just helps us control the process of, uh, both sending the emails and reporting the data back to the clients. Wow. Now, when you're talking about doing quick, you know, like this stuff, are you um, sending, is it mostly business to business or is it business to consumer? Because obviously there's challenges with Gmail sandboxes and Outlook, I forget what they're called, like clutter boxes mm. or whatever they're called. You know what I mean? How, uh, are you mostly doing business to business so they have like a domain extension or do you do, you do Gmail yeah. and stuff too? Uh, no, so we're, we're, we're 100% B2B. Okay. Uh, so I should say, if we're doing cold emails, we're 100% B2B. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have a couple of B2C clients we build funnels for, but they use other services like like uh, Active Campaign, for example, is a great one yep. for, for, for B2C emails. But for outreach, it's purely just going straight to businesses. That's great. That's great. I mean, I think when you're, when you're talking about email, I think one of the challenges that you're really trying to hope for is the deliverability rate. You know what I mean? Because... There are mm. challenges. There's certain servers. There's certain clients you might be reaching out to, and they have the settings dialed up really high. And then you're also looking at everything from not can spam laws. I mean, can spam laws, obviously, mm. but just making sure that your 
your server stays whitelisted. Are there any tactics you use to make sure that when you're doing cold outreach that you stay clean? <laughs> Is that the phrase to use? Yeah, 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 definitely. So uh, there's 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 a tactical. Then there's what you can do on the emails themselves. So tactically, we actually built our own email service. So a lot of the issues that you'll come across in terms of cold emailing is if you scale too quickly, you're operating on the same servers as, as other companies and, and, and as other people. So if someone else on the system or server does the wrong thing, the entire server can potentially get blacklisted. So yep. we've kind of built our own service. So we know exactly what's going through that. Uh, okay. From a technical perspective, I mean, I've got tech people. I don't know. I'm not going to, I probably butchered it. They're just like shaking their heads going, well, shut up. You're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the, there's a technical side to it. Sure. There's also the people side. So the people side being the emails that we write, we write it in a very specific way that doesn't come across as you know spammy or doesn't annoy people. And we always give them the option to opt out easily. Mm-hmm. So I'd rather have someone opting out of our emails versus marking us as spam. And that's a better way to approach it. Because if you get marked as spam too many times, you are going to get blacklisted anyway. Sure. Uh, so the email copy does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of getting into inboxes and actually not getting listed as spam. Gotcha. Gotcha. Nice. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the metrics that you look at. Um, when you are, when you're talking about, you know, whether it's cold blast or even, you know, warm blast and things like that, mm. what are the metrics that when you think of first, what are the, what are the metrics from an email sending standpoint that matter most? Yeah. So I, I work backwards from, from what I call the North star metric. And so the North star metric uh, is p- particularly when we're looking at working with clients is what is your return on investment? So it means we track all the way up to like, have you got closed sales? How much were your sales worth in terms of revenue versus how much have you paid us? Mm. And if that North star metric is, is right, I mean, everything else is kind of gravy on top. Uh, if that North star metric isn't right, we work backwards and say, well, what is the reply rate? Uh, especially with cold emails, we operate mm. on replies. So people are sending us emails back saying, yes, I'm open to a phone call. Yes, I'm open to, to receiving some more information. Mm. So that is quite important. Um, before the reply rate, sometimes you look at the click rate. So in particular, if we have links to websites, things like that, we do track how many of them are actually clicking through to a website from the cold email. Yep. Um, and then obviously before that, we've got the open rate, like how many people are actually opening the emails mm-hmm. because that tells us is it getting into inboxes or not. And then are you using any retargeting ads or anything like that after they've, um, they've clicked through? Yeah, so we do a lot of the, uh, so there is kind of two separate sets. One is we, when we build the list, we actually plug it back into platforms like LinkedIn, for example, and we retarget, but not like it's a custom audience. And we advertise to the same audience as we're sending the emails to. Okay. Uh, afterwards, depending on the list size, depending on how many people we've got on the list, we do retargeting as well. But um, it, if the list is pretty small, it's hard to find the audiences. Okay, so you, if I heard that right, not only are you emailing them, but you're also putting it into a LinkedIn campaign as well. So that you're kind of hitting them in both yeah. platforms. Yeah, that's great. It, mm, and it also depends on uh, how intensive uh, my clients want, want to go about it. Yep. So we also do direct mail. So for example, we'll oh, wow. email, we send them something in the post, and then we'll do LinkedIn retargeting, Facebook re- retargeting. It really depends on the value of each deal uh, and the value of each client to them. Mm. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. And um, are you using any software like automation software? Do you connect to anything like that? Maybe it's HubSpot, Marketo, um, you know, um, uh, I use Infusionsoft or anything like that. Yeah. So we, uh, for ourselves, we, we definitely use HubSpot. I've got clients who, who, are, who are across mm-hmm. a multiple CRM systems. Yep. Uh, we do integrate quick mail into the CRMs sometimes, but other okay. times, um, because what we do, you know, we don't see high volume. It's not like we're going through and getting hundreds of thousands of leads for a single client every day. The leads are typically high value, but there's lower volume. So yep. we actually have one full-time team member um, taking care of one client and they have an, uh, they've got access to, to the CRM systems as, as a salesperson. And so when a lead comes through, they'll actually enter into the deal into their CRM. Oh, wow. Wow. That's really cool. And so I like that, that ratio of one to one, because I think a lot of times mm. clients will be set up so that I don't know how to describe it other than the number one ways a lot of marketing companies make money is, is that they load a ton of clients all on one 
account manager, but this whole like one to one basis, it's it's way more of a personal touch or a white glove approach. I, I like that a lot. That's something similar to what we do. The most accounts awesome. a team can have. So every client we have, you get an account manager and a project manager, and the most that mm. two person team can have is five clients. So That's what really we great. found is that as opposed to just churning clients, the more energy we mm. put into clients, the more we retain them. And that was it was easier on my sales team because we had less churn. Yeah, yeah exactly. One thing I found as a as, as a uh, indirect benefit from that is my team member really starts to understand the client so well. And so as we're building, for example, a list of outreach contacts or, you know, as we're looking at new campaigns, they'll come up to me and say, hey, actually, I think this isn't the right contact because of this. Like, it's just the nuance that you really miss if a team's spread too thin. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's been, been an indirect benefit, which has really helped my clients get results and retentions yeah. going through the roof when we've actually changed this kind of model. Yeah, yeah. So I want to circle back to uh, click-through rate. And so one of the things mm-hmm. that I... I've kind of been a student of is a guy named Larry Kim and Larry Kim developed something called unicorn marketing. And you know, one of the things he talks about through unicorn marketing is, is that there's so many companies that, that base a lot of their marketing on what I would call vanity numbers. In other words, they want more mm-hmm. visits to their website or, you know, they want, um, I don't know, a lot of times it'd be leads, but a lot of times they're never judging the quality of the lead. And so one of the metrics that he really, really focuses on, is actually click-through rate. Now, yours is one step above that with reply rate and, re- and request more information rate. That's, that's the crown jewel. That's amazing. But do you find that you'll, you'll talk to clients and I'm just, you're just like, hey, you know what? It's, it's one thing to open, but it's a whole thing entirely mm-hmm. when they actually come to your website or they request more information. Or, in, in other words, do you find clients that are just measuring the wrong things? Yeah, like for example, we'll have clients come through to us and um, so obviously cold, cold email is quite, quite different to, to, to nurture emails and also warm emails. But we do have clients coming through like, hey, can you look at our, our, our email sequence to, to existing you know, to, to existing leads? And they'll say, that, hey, it's pretty good, right? Like I've got 30% open rates on, on this single email. And they're missing the fact that the subject line has got nothing to do with the email body copy and mm. they haven't got clicks or replies from it. And they're like, this is a pretty good email. I'm like, it's actually not. Like, it's harming your, your brand. It's tricking people into opening emails without looking at what they're doing. So I, I definitely find that uh, to actually be the yeah. case. Um, one of the things I always say to clients is, look, if you're getting sales from emails, even if the open rate is really, really bad, but you're generating really positive sales and really positive leads. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I don't even care about the open rate because the email is doing the job that the email is supposed to, mm-hmm. which is generating interest from the people who are actually qualified to buy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm definitely in, in, in kind of the same boat in believing that there's going to be a better purpose than just open rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whether it's replies or clicks, I think it's definitely a more important metric than, than opens. And do you find that, do you, do you work on a, on a, standard retainer or do you work on a cost per lead cost you know what i mean cost per goal retainer like how does that how does how does your retainers work yeah so traditionally we've been pretty much standard retainer uh so we have a set fee that we charge every month Mm -hmm. but we're more and more we're moving towards mixed uh mixed models so what i mean by that is we've traditionally worked with a lot of corporate clients you know where they're customers worth five hundred thousand dollars on that model they're just like look i'll just pay you what what you want just get us two or three clients per per quarter and we're very happy we're over the moon um but a lot of the clients coming through to us now are smaller companies who can't don't necessarily can't necessarily afford the fees that we we charge to corporates and so what we do is we do a mixed retainer and also rev share model Mm-hmm. So we charge a smaller retainer, but we take a certain percentage of sales when they actually close. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, let me circle back to this theory with unicorn marketing, and we're going to see how it applies mm. to your approach, and in particular to email marketing. And one of the things that Larry Kim says is that the large majority of our return or our outcome commonly comes down to maybe five to maybe even 15% of our content. And so what he means by that is is that the large majority of emails that we write, the large majority of blogs that we write, Mm -hmm. the large majority of any other content that we write, you have to understand that most of it does not work. Most of it doesn't generate links. Most of it, you know, essentially, a lot of what you do in the world of marketing 
it usually comes down to maybe five to 10% of the things that really, really work for you basically drive the largest majority of the return. And so it's funny because marketers tend to think that we have to pump out more and more content. And what he says is, is that once you've established or developed a unicorn, milk the unicorn for all that it's worth. Mm. So what I'm wondering is on your side, when you create that gem of an email, the gem of a subject line and the gem of a funnel, do you find mm. that, you know what, like I would rather double down on a winning funnel than I would to, um, I'm not saying forever, but I'm saying at least double down on mm. it as opposed to thinking that the next funnel and the next funnel and the next funnel is going to be my winner. Yeah, that's a really great point. Uh, so I, I definitely tripled down on, on, on winners. So for me, we split test so much, but yep. people kind of get, I don't know if this is the right word, but they kind of get a little bit religious about split, split testing, right? With like, you have to split, you always have to split test. And my whole philosophy is, well, what's the point of a split test? The point of a split test is to find a winner. So once you find a winner, why would you keep, spending resources split testing versus tripling down on the winner yeah because the winners probably aren't going to keep winning forever there will come a time when the numbers drop off the results taper off and you do have to go back to split testing but part of what we did as an agency saying look um and and you know that that idea of five or five to fifty percent of your marketing being driving the results that's I, I see that too, but it's like, where, how do you, find, you need to go volume until you find that, right? Yep. But once you find that, why would you stay on volume? Why wouldn't you just triple and, you know, mm -hmm. make all the money you can while you've got the winners? Yep. Um, so I'm definitely a big believer in that. Yeah. Um, and, and he says he yeah. creates more content assets off of his winner. So for example, his funnel would mm. include, he would put, say it's a blog, just humor me here. Say it's a blog. He would turn the blog yep. into an infographic and then he would also create a video for it. And then he might break it into different hub and spoke models so that more and more content's all pushing to the winner as opposed to having mm. an editorial calendar constantly putting out more content. And I don't care whether it performed, I'm still just going to look for the next hit and the next hit and the next mm. hit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I've, I've, I've got a client who's doing probably, you know, bootstrap, growing from scratch. They're doing probably $50 million a year now. And so my client was a really great marketer as well, or is a really great marketer to build the business that did. And something he said to me really stood out. So we were having lunch and he said, look, probably only 30% of my campaigns really crush it. Uh, but that 30%, has grown my business from zero to $50 million a year. Yeah. And I'm comfortable with losing on 70% of the stuff we do, knowing that when we do find a winner, I put 100% behind the winners. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's just the whole concept. And then he obviously you know, spins off the winners and creates sim similar things. If it's a funnel, he'll create something kind of similar to it, put into a different market. Um, but once you find the winner, it's like just triple down and just milk it for all you can. Yeah, yeah, that's that's... I mean, there's more to the unicorn marketing approach, but that's, that's definitely mm. a winner that he does. You know, he, he scales it with more paid ads. He scales it with, um, mm. you know, targeted approaches and stuff like that. But I, I agree a thousand percent. Now let's talk about you find that, that, that winning piece of data or whatever that is. You, you know what you're looking for. Where do you start first? When you, when you take on a new client, what do you start with first? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I typically look at what they've done in the past that's worked and what hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And then the next question I, I ask is, well, if it's worked, why have you either stopped doing it or why haven't you scaled it yourself? Mm. And generally, if something's worked in the past, I'll go back to it and analyze why it's worked and then throw up some tests based on that. And sometimes it's as easy as, well, it worked for a bit, but they didn't read the numbers right. So if we go mm. back and scale that, that generates results. Mm. Uh, it can be as simple as that. Otherwise, it's as simple as potentially that they've got a really good funnel, but they haven't thought about the offer. Or there's one key element missing. So I start with what worked before and then figure out how I can get it to work again. Or if it's worked before and it's still working, how do we scale that without breaking the numbers? And then do you ever find that sometimes the, the, the brush is too broad? What I mean by that is, is that they would actually get more, um, more open rates or sponsor rates and things like that if they would niche down a little bit more. Do you have the power to say, hey, you know what? 
I could do this email approach, but you're you're trying to do this one size fits all email blast versus segmenting like crazy and really getting the right message to the right client at the right time. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. And one of the clients in particular comes to mind around that. And you know, they were already a very successful business, but their product was very broad market. And so what we did for this client was we actually uh, help them to to niche into five specific markets from the generalized market. Mm -hmm. So that meant we could increase the pricing because the product was now speaking to the set market. The marketing was way more effective and everything just worked a lot better. And, you know, the market size was actually still the same, right? Because they were still talking to the same number of people, but mm -hmm. now it's just more specific in each of the five key markets. And so that really rapidly helped them to, to actually grow. Uh, and I think they were going from, you know, a 2.8, um, ROI, which, which, which isn't bad, but that straight away would lift them to like nine point something just because of the price increase and how specific the marketing actually worked. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's what we see as well. It's like the more you can hyper personalize, the more you can, mm. you know, uh, not to sound redundant, get the right message to the right potential client at the right time. You know, our rates, mm. uh, improve dramatically. What's easy to do is easy not to do. And what I mean by that is, is that it's easy to just look at your list and wake up one day and it's like, you haven't pruned mm. this thing in a long time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, list, list hygiene, list health is, is so important, right? Um, yep. I'd, I'd rather have a 1,000 per strong email list that uh, interacts with me, that you know opens 50% of the emails that I send to them versus a 100,000 strong list where... There's minimal engagement, zero sales, zero click through. Uh, there's there's just no point. You're just paying for 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 tire kickers to, to be on the email list. Whereas I'd rather have one thousand true fans. As uh, I think it's like a big Tim Ferriss quote mm -hmm. based on someone else's article. One thousand true fans. Um, I'd rather take that approach. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, now, how often do you find that you look at the metrics? Uh, we we absolutely live in brave it. So even even though we you know, run cold emails, run funnels. We build, we build our own, own Google Data Studio set around the campaigns. And one of the things I do uh, every morning is I sit with, with my leadership team. And we look at every single client's metrics and go, is it green? Is it yellow? Is it red? Uh, so we, we live and breathe by it. We've got uh, metrics that tell us, you know, give us a forecast in terms of results and metrics that look backwards and, and track results. So uh, we work off it re religiously. That's, that's great. That's great. I mean, that's one of those things where for us, we can do death by data. What happens with that, that, that can be a problem is, is that when you look at, when you look at certain metrics like SEO, that's, hmm. that's a dangerous thing to look at every day. Cause I'm like, man, this thing fluctuates all the time. They're, tr they're turning the dials at, at, at Google all the time. You know what I mean? But then hmm. when you're looking at campaigns, email blasts and things like that, I'm like, I'm shocked at how many companies, um, they only really care about like the open rates as opposed to engagement and looking at certain metrics mm. like it's not just the most basic metrics that you want to look at there's 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 things in 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 user behavior that i'm always trying to calculate into the equation because there's people in the awareness stage and you know this and i'm sorry if I'm, I'm talking to my audience here i know you know no, there's awareness consideration and decision level in fact there's some people that even say there's like five stages but sometimes when you're hitting people and they already know a lot about your product and you hit them with awareness content, it's like almost like setting them back. And on the other hand, mm. if you are like in a heavy decision level push and saying buy now, buy now, buy now, but they're in the research phase, that can basically get them a little bit spooked as well. And so when I'm looking at our campaigns and I'm looking at our numbers, what I'm also trying to figure out is when I segment is I'm trying to figure out where do they fit in these buckets? Because it's one thing to have them by niche, but it would be awesome. It's also a really good thing to figure out where do I believe they are in their buyer's journey. Yeah, definitely. And we we actually split up a lot of our campaigns the same way. So even though we do cold outreach, and people think of cold outreach, we're just trying to get people on the phone. A lot of the campaigns we do actually isn't driving to a phone call; it's driving to a piece of content. And so then we actually nurture those people very differently to to a cold lead. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it applies across all different types of campaigns. That's cool. That's cool. Now I'm going to talk to you about this other theory cause we're, we're getting close to our time. There's this theory that I've been looking at and it turns out that, that when, when the Russians play chess and they have these chess masters and the kids go to like these chess academies, 
when you get to a master level and they're just in training, they do a thing where they take away their queens and they don't let them play with their queens. Because what happens is, is that a lot of times you get so dependent on the queen that you don't work on your other mm. skills, if that makes any sense. And so, yep. like in my yep. house, in my company, we focus so much on SEO. And the challenge this year is to say, hey, if I snap my fingers and SEO was gone, where do we bring value? What do we do? You know? Mm. And so I was trying to figure out from you, from your perspective, what is your queen? Uh, that's a really interesting question. It's probably one of the best questions I've had. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we cheat in having two queens. And mm. one of the queens is my copywriting, which we're actually mm. actively working to, to, to play without. And the second one is cold emails in general. Mm. Uh, so the first one is for so long, it's been reliant, you know, the company's been reliant on me writing the cold emails. And I've always hung on to it, said, oh, it's just me. It's my, my magic skill set. It's actually not. Uh, we, uh, the magic is in the thinking and understanding of it, but it's definitely trainable. So we posed a question about six months ago and said, look, what could we scale to? What could we look like if I wasn't sitting on, on the cold emails myself? Yeah, sure. Um, and so we've already almost remove the queen by hiring copywriters and coming up with a unique training system yeah. just for cold emails. Um, and I don't even think that was a queen. I think that was, um, it, was it was a massive crutch. Uh, so I wouldn't even call it, thinking about it now, I wouldn't even call it queen. The queen though would be, what if cold emails turned illegal everywhere? Because there's certain countries like Germany and Canada where it's actually not legal to cold email. So what if it got, you know, the same law got implemented in the US and the UK and Australia? Uh, I think there are still certain ways that we can get the intention of businesses mm -hmm. by building the funnels that we do. Yeah. So the reason why we do two things is we've got cold emails in funnel building and ads is because if any one of those turns out that, hey, we can't do it anymore, we've got the other two to kind of fall back on. Yeah. And if both of those go, we can go into consulting mode and look at how to consult on offers and copy. So that would be our, our play. I think we didn't have our queen. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just one of those things as an agency and you know, you have so much responsibility with so many employees. It's something always in the back of my mind is it's like, am I only favoring, you know, my, I played a lot of soccer. Like, am I only the guy who can go right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where <laughs> a lot of really dominant soccer players or footballers, basically, they can always go right, but they end up scoring more goals with their opposite foot because um, mm -hmm. the, the strength basically gets them leaning one way and you can always kind of score off your, off your non-dominant foot. And that's kind of what I'm always looking at as a company. It's like, Hey, I think it's great mm -hmm. that you're, that you're obsessing about the training that we're doing, but I always have to figure out, you know, is there another way? Because I don't want to wake up one day and find out that, you know, someone moved our cheese. And then now it's just like all of a sudden I have to lay people off because old mm -hmm. tricks didn't work, you know? It's just something you keep, keep in the back of your mind. But if you're strengthening the other tools, it's only going to make your entire system mm -hmm. stronger. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 we had a real um, issue around that. I think it might have been about four years ago where uh, we, we, used to run, we used to run emails off, off either Google or, 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 or Microsoft. And overnight, they literally changed the way that the system was set up. So we couldn't even send cold emails. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I saw there were so many other cold email agencies. And they were just like, well, we're out of business now. Yeah. We, we can't get emails into inboxes. And so we figured out how to do it by building our own email servers. But it's always been a lesson to me. Like, what if it happens again? What if, it, what if some change comes through that we have no control over? What would we do? So, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely, I've lived through that. And it was a pretty stressful time. And that's when... Uh, in fact, at that point, we had actually stopped doing funnels and stopped doing ads to purely, purely focus on cold emails. And then we brought the funnel and ads back because that meant we had some safety if anything happens to one or the other. That's very cool. That's very cool. Um, all right. And then finally, you know, um, uh, if you were to do it over again, you know, you started your business, you know, nearly eight mm. years ago. If you knew now, uh, you know, if you knew then what you knew now, what would you have done differently? And don't say invest in Google. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> uh, well, if I can't say invest in Google, I say invest in Bitcoin. Yeah, no, there you go. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, I think I would have specialized and niched a lot sooner, a lot, lot sooner. 
uh, because that's when we started to really hit our stride and start charging the prices that we should have. Mm-hmm. I would have focused on the thing that I like doing versus trying to do everything else. Because we, used, you know, when I first started, I tried to do Google ads, SEO, Facebook ads, LinkedIn profile writing, all this kind of stuff. I would have just scrapped all of that. And uh, you know, my advice would be just pick the one thing that you're really damn good at, that you really like doing, that you can talk about all day, every day, because then it's really hard for these companies to come in and try and beat you on that. Um, your passion will always show through. So up until a certain stage, you just need that one service. You need the one audience, the one niche that you're going to do it for. And you just need to get out to your niche and just talk to them and just understand them. Um, I think that's a, that's a Hormozy thing, right? Um, when Alex Hormozy says to get to seven figures, it's like one audience, one uh, channel or one you know um, source of leads and one offer. Mm. Uh, that I think would, would have, really, have really helped us to grow a lot faster and save us a lot of the stress. And who was that author? His last name was Mosey? Uh, Alex, um, a- Alex Hormozy. Alex um, Hormozy? So, uh, uh, Hormozy, H-O-R-M-O-Z-I. He wrote a book uh, called The $100 Million Offers. Um, and he's got a really great YouTube channel as well. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know what? I probably know him by face. I. I follow a lot of guys. I probably do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, finally, um, who is your ideal audience and then how would they find out about you and your organization? Sure, so um, our ideal audience, there's, I, I always come back to two. I always cheat, so I'm sorry about that. You always ask me a direct question, I give, oh, there's two answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is, you know, software companies, B2B software companies that, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, that have high value clients. They're our number one, one audience. The second is smaller businesses uh, in the B2B space, whether it's a consultant uh, or a service provider, mm-hmm. doing over you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars a year who want to grow to seven figures and beyond. Um, and so typically they find us via, um, I do have a podcast, but we're ramping up our podcast game. Mm-hmm. We've got a new website coming out, Startup Growth Inspo, where we actually detail all the stuff that we do for our clients and have examples of, of good, uh, good things happening. Otherwise, Growth Labs with a Z dot com is, is mm-hmm. our main website. Yeah. And I'm going to put that in the description notes. So we are at the end of our time. Uh, Will, thank you so much for joining us. Um, big fan of, of you and your company. And uh, I think you're on to big, big things. So to my audience, please check out Growth Labs. Again, Growth Labs with a Z. I'll put it in the description. And uh, if you are uh, new to the channel, please uh, click on the notification bell and subscribe. You know, we would love to get this content out to you as often as possible. And, um, you know, our goal with this podcast is to get um, the most innovative thought leaders to join us to talk about the world of marketing and so hopefully you can apply it to your own approach, see what works, see what sticks, and check back often because we're always bringing on the best possible thought leaders we can get on. And Will, you're absolutely one of them. So thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, Chris. It's been so fun.